Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Hello and welcome to episode number 23 of the Wall Street Lab podcast. I am Luke. And I'm Andy. And we are your co-hosts. And today we have something really exciting for you guys because we have Peter Schwicht on the podcast today. And he is one of the most prominent characters of the European asset management scene, as you will see in the interview. Yes, Peter's going to talk about his career in the interview, but let me just give you the headlines. He is the former JP Morgan Asset Management EMEA CEO. He has had various positions before that within JP Morgan, reaching from auditing over trading in Argentina to be Mr. Deutschmark. So he was basically head of trading for JP Morgan in Germany. And now he's on the board of several companies. So be really excited. We talk about cool topics like how regulation affects asset management, what mega trends are in the asset management space, like environmental, social and governance, ESG for short. And he also gives you some really good career advice. So listen carefully and enjoy the show. And if you like our podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. This really helps us to grow the show and reach larger audiences. And now, without further ado, please enjoy our interview with Peter Schwicht. Hi, Peter. It's a great pleasure to have you here today in Frankfurt. I'm really happy you could make the time. And we always ask, how do you explain someone that is not in finance, for example, at a dinner party, what are you doing or what did you do? Yeah, Andreas, uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's a very good forum for people who are interested in this field. And I would like to say, or what I've said in the past, that dinner parties are so, that I have been managing money for retail and institutional investors. And when they ask what is a retail investor, it is somebody who is just in the street. And instead of bringing the money to a savings account, just buying an investment fund. Institutional investor is somebody who is a pension fund, or a sovereign wealth fund or insurance company, who, uh, which has lots of money to invest, um, which then companies like JP Morgan Asset Management just invest for a long period of time. Perfect. So you said you've been working for JP Morgan for a long time. I saw you have various positions in the bank. Could you explain a bit what you did over the years? Yes, I'm very happy to do that. I just, I started about a hundred years ago, <laughs> basically in 87, in the auditing department because I actually studied taxation and auditing uh, at the university. And that was at that time for me the ideal start to come to a big US firm. But very shortly thereafter, I just thought that the areas I had been auditing were a lot more interesting than what I actually did in auditing. Namely, I was auditing the training department and I applied to get on the training program for traders and salespeople at JP Morgan. Then the investment bank, which was at that time still a relatively small bank of like 14,000 people. And I was admitted to this training program and then I just stayed on for the next training program and after, when I came back I just started my training career which did last about 12 years. So I first of all started, which at that time were still exotic instruments like interest rate swaps and forward rate agreements. Now everybody knows about this and, but at that time it was still relatively new. I was trading uh, money market instruments, I was trading bonds. Um, then I moved into uh, like the investment portfolio, so where the bank actually uses its own capital to invest in 
securities, at that time fixed income securities. Um, then I spent three years on sales, on the sales side, selling many of these instruments and then I became the head of global markets for, for Germany at that time and with that came um, basically the position of being Mr. Deutschmark, meaning like the guy who is investing the Deutschmark for uh, for JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. I would have done that a little bit longer, but unfortunately at that time, that was 97, they actually started trading the euro and from a kind of a decentralized structure of JP Morgan as well as other firms, which had trading of Deutschmark securities in Germany and the French franc securities in Paris and so on, it all became a centralized approach where the euro was traded in London. At that time I was thinking about just moving to London, but then I just received a call from my previous boss and the call went as follows. Uh, Peter, have you ever been to Argentina? No. Do you speak Spanish? No. Have you ever traded emerging markets? No. You want to do all of this? I so, said, well, let me think about it. And actually, three months later, I was there with my still young family. I was in Buenos Aires. So I stayed there in Buenos Aires on, for a year and a half, and I was the treasurer and the head of local markets uh, in, in Buenos Aires and Argentina. It was a, quite an exciting time because during my tenure there, it was a time when long-term capital, some of you may have heard about this hedge fund went bust and then there was the Russian crisis and like with short-term interest rates to moving well above a thousand percent. So I learned a lot of things which I never thought would happen. But unfortunately like the emerging markets kind of deteriorated significantly and uh, that was all also then the end of my career on the trading side because the, like the investment and I was the investment of JP Morgan into Argentina to develop certain things just became disinvestments and I was looking for something else and moved into asset management at that time and that was in 99. Uh, initially it was head of Germany and then I added the continental European institutional business, then I added uh, some of the retail businesses in Austria, then in Switzerland, and then in the Nordics. And in 2012, I just became the head of EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa. But the vast majority of that business is in Europe. And uh, I moved to London and I stayed there for three years. It was a very exciting time because at that time we managed more than $300 billion in Europe. Uh, it was also a very exciting time when regulation, a lot more regulation came in and governance was a lot more important. And we just continued to develop the business in a way that it became more and more, more uh, interesting uh, also for the firm. I've been commuting between London and, and Frankfurt during those years, or three years in London, and there was a time when I thought enough is enough. Uh, and so I just, I wouldn't say I retired, because neither a pensioner, but I just stopped working in an executive position at the very end of 2014. Since then, I just, I'm just i still on, a, on the Luxembourg board of JP Morgan as a management and a couple of other boards. So that's what I've been doing in basically in the past three years. And Brits would say I went plural. So instead of having one job, I have several jobs. And <laughs> I have to say, this is something what I just very much enjoy. In particular, that I don't have to do the kind of daily stuff which every senior manager has to do, main, namely just to deal with all the problems which arise every day. And you don't know 
exactly what what the next next day's problems will be. That's very impressive. The CV you went through and so many questions I have on on some smaller things, but let me start. You talked a bit about from being an executive to managing different companies or to be at the board of different companies. How did your life change during that? Well, it it is a very drastic change from before. Um, it starts with the fact that I'm not at seven o'clock in, the, in my office anymore, <laughs> but rather like I try to be at my desk at nine and don't work for 12 hours anymore. And if I stop working, I don't carry the work with me. Uh, and that was a kind of 24-7 job. It's one of those jobs which you just either you do it or you don't do it, but you mm -hmm. cannot just do it a little bit less. This was a discussion I've been having years and years and years with, with lots of my friends who just had different type of jobs and say, why don't you just work less? I cannot work less. <laughs> Every year it actually became more. Yeah. And now, first of all, I can pick and choose what, what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I can just tune it up or tune it down. And just, for example, in, in the summer, I just try to do less because I just traveling is a lot nicer in, in the summer than kind of November or February. In November and February, I'm, I'm happy to, to spend more time <laughs> at the desk. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, let me go back a bit. I want to know a bit more about what you learned during the crisis you went through. I mean, you have seen a lot. You have seen the Russia crisis. You have seen the emerging markets crisis. You have seen the financial crisis. What was it that you learned from all those crises? Well, uh, there's uh, actually started in the year of the crisis in '87. That was actually the biggest one-day loss in the equity markets at Wall Street in '87. And then there was kind of the dot-com crisis. It was the the emerging markets crisis, and one of the many emerging market crises, and then um, the financial crisis. I think what I what I learned there was to think the unthinkable, so that everybody says this is not going to happen. And many things did happen, which actually never thought. People never thought that it would that they would happen. So it's it's this concept of think the unthinkable. That's mm -hmm. clearly something what I've learned. And the other one is is stay cool no matter what what's happening around you because if you're nervous you just make mistakes. And the third one is as little as you know your clients actually know less. So it is very important to stay very close to clients and talk to them. And even minuscule in information at times is something which kind of everybody out there is craving for because I think you're surrounded by so many news wires and, and internal information. You hear something from other clients all over the world. You, have, you hear something from your senior management which knows something about regulators or something like that. So it's all of this information is something what is not easily accessible for the general public, for sure, but also for very sophisticated investors. So there it is very important to stay close to the clients. That's great advice. Thank you. Did you see as part of those crises, or you said regulation and governance changed a lot, especially after the crisis. Can you go a bit deeper into how it changed the asset management space? Asset management was clearly not necessarily the, uh, the driver of the, of the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, but the banks were very much involved and a lot of the regulation, which has been dealing with banks had an impact on the asset managers uh, for two reasons. First of all, many of the asset managers' clients are actually other banks, mm -hmm. and therefore they like on the distribution side or the capital raising side, on the trading side for if, the, if to source equities or fixed income. But also if, if an asset manager is a subsidiary of a bank, then they also have to deal with some of the rules which affect the bank. 
and maybe just as sidestep regulation in general whether it, it is directed at banks or the financial industry as a whole thinking about mifid or like prips or many of the other things it just it is it is affecting the entire industry and for an asset manager it doesn't matter whether it affects the asset manager itself or the clients so if if an insurance company now needs new information about this and this and this and this product somebody has to provide it and if they just buy our funds then we have to provide the information so so therefore we also are affected by something which is actually valid for another part of the industry absolutely you already mentioned mifid and many of our listeners they were very curious what your thoughts are on mifid especially on how it affects smaller versus bigger asset manager is there a difference is it because i hear a lot of people complaining that they like sometimes can't do the business anymore they used to do because the regulations got so high do you share that or do you think small asset management as it managers can still be competitive well mifid is is just a very complex regulation and it's it affects both the distributors you just buy a fund somewhere you just now have to go through a long protocol of transparency and you have to say that you know this and that you say, say uh, to do that so therefore many of the uh, yeah many of the the asset management asset management's clients actually are affected and therefore again asset managers are affected but i think what many of your listeners have questions about is kind of the research part of the business so in the past just for those who are not that so much of an expert in the past investment banks have been providing research in terms of economic research but in first and foremost company research about a company for example in, in Germany about a chemical company so they've been saying okay this is positive and this is negative near the numbers and and we would actually just call this a buy and the other one is called no rather hold or something like that and there's kind of many of the investment banks have been just using this as a as a service for the asset managers who have been uh, buying and selling securities so like for example buying this this german chem chemical company so so if the asset manager wants to uh, invest in this company they just go to an investment bank and buy the shares mm -hmm. or buy the, buy the fixed income securities it started actually in the uk where the regulator said well this is a service which there's possibility for conflict of interest and by the way there is a cost associated with it and this cost is actually not being shown so going forward say if you want to have a certain amount of research that you just have to pay for this mm -hmm. so and, and then initially the question was okay who is going to pay for it is this is this the end client the consumer mm -hmm. or is it the asset manager Initially, it was a split, so so many of the asset managers wanted to pay, and, and then other asset managers said, no, uh, I think the end client should pay. But more and more asset managers then actually said, okay, we, we are going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then it's your question, like, if you just need a lot of research, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of numbers flying around, but it's just on the margin. It's an additional cost for every asset manager. Yeah. Is it easier to carry additional cost for a large asset manager? Definitely. And there are actually some very large asset managers who have buy side research, like in versus the sell side research yeah. of of the investment bank, but they actually do their research themselves. But smaller, smaller asset managers actually, for them, it's a little bit more difficult to have dedicated analysts. If you just have a billion or five billion or ten billion or something like that assets on the management, obviously, even a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand or something like that is a lot in terms of additional costs. 
So on the margin, it it is indeed better, or let's say there's an advantage if you're a bigger asset manager. If you, if you just have more revenues, if you then you can just afford buying more research, mm-hmm. and that that in turn, if you just can buy more research, then in theory, all else being equal, the output is going to be better. So, is this a unwanted byproduct of this this regulation? I'm pretty sure that this is an unwanted consequence of this regulation that it, in contrast to kind of where you, everybody wants more competition, is actually something which is against mm-hmm. competition. Where, and it's very tough for smaller asset managers. Do you feel like that research is actually being purchased still, even after MIFI 2? Or do you think yeah, it was... Course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it just you, you need some research. Kind of, it, it's it's a question. Well, some of the investment banks are just putting all their research, or let's say, eighty percent of the research just on the internet, so it's free. So mm-hmm. then it's then then there's clearly no price tag involved. But for example, if if you want to talk to the re, to the researcher who actually did write this report mm-hmm. to have give the access to to this person, because you might want to have additional information or you don't understand it or you just would like to ask questions which in the past was a service which was just offered to many of the clients now they have to pay for it mm-hmm. yeah but of course companies will will buy uh, research yeah but is that good for the investment banks definitely not is that good for independent researchers yeah i think there there's a there's a bigger market now for independent research Why is it not good for the investment banks? More and more asset managers are not willing to pay as much for research anymore, but rather build their own buy side research. Okay. Yeah. Then what's going to happen to the sell side research at, at, at the investment banks? And this also has an impact on the commissions which have been paid from the asset managers to, to, the, uh, yeah, to the investment banks. All of this is very detailed. I think just there, there might be some other questions about megatrends and asset management. Yeah, you mentioned megatrends. What do you what do you see as a megatrend in asset management? One is clearly the advent and the big growth of passive investments. And I think in the U.S., passive is, has now more assets under management than active. So it's passive it's growing 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 but i think except for the past six months there were also some significant outflows from passive because if this is just an asset asset allocation mechanism then then people just will also just sell passive funds a lot quicker than many of the active funds in the past but passive versus active is big big one and then then i think Factor investing and algorithmic uh, investing is is another one, and active passive and and algo and and so on. But I think one of the biggest trends is really that socially responsible investing is becoming more and more important. And there are some as a managers who say, well, regular investing kind of without. SRI or with, without any of these filters is going to be a thing of the past. Yeah, so that that all of the funds going forward will uh, stick to certain rules that they're not going to buy weapon producers or or kind of pornography or alcohol mm-hmm. or uh, some of the oil companies which just do don't do really good. To, For the environment, and and uh, one of the CEOs of the large companies actually said, "Well, for them, it becomes more and more important to invest not only in firms which just generate a good uh, financial performance, but also which do something positive for society." Uh, and I find this quite remarkable that more and more people are thinking about mm-hmm. this, and just and that's. Uh, it's actually a challenge for for all of the asset managers to just also show that 
if you buy a socially responsible uh, fund that the performance is as good or maybe even better mm -hmm. uh, than, than one which has many of the vices in it or many of those air polluters or something like that in it. So this, this is, I know in the general public you don't read a lot about it, but this, this is actually a very good sign also for, for I, I think, society as a whole, that the investors and kind of they obviously have the means uh, by changing something because if they want they don't invest anymore mm. yeah so and th therefore they can just vote with their money or with their feet which i find actually quite interesting well maybe something changes if the, if it's from the money side right yeah. it's not yeah. it's not hippies on the streets anymore uh, demanding the stop of war or anything but it's like now money managers with trillions of dollars that are saying okay we want to go into this direction and we want to have ESG criteria yeah i think it was just quite remarkable that that there was was so much noise after the shootings in, in Florida in February this mm -hmm. this year, and that some investors said, well, we're just going to be very careful about how we're going to invest in some of these gun manufacturers or gun distributors, or they're not going to invest in them anymore, or just they would like to know how, you know, how they want to prevent something like this happening again, mm -hmm. or just, uh, I don't know, whether you follow it, but even Apple said that they're now just going to start a campaign on just how to make sure that using your your iPhone is not that addictive anymore. So okay. th this is this is also something which was raised by some of the asset managers and say that we are very concerned about that. And how do you address this? It's a wide array of, of areas where companies who have been asked in shareholder meetings to report on diversity or gender pay or just something like what I just uh, said about Apple. Many of the other topics which you read in the newspaper every day or in the, in the, in the news wires every day, that this is also being asked from the asset managers to, to the board of directors or, or CEO of, of those companies and they now do need to report on it. And once you need to report on it, then you just are really thinking very hard kind of next time you have to you have to report on it that you haven't re, uh, really improved it and if you have improved it it's good for you and if you haven't improved on it it's bad for you mm -hmm. so that's that for me one of the big changes in, in asset management do you think this power is influenced by the flow into passive i mean i imagine that most of this Asset managers going to board me is like, hey, I'm holding X percent of your shares in my active funds. That this is mostly active funds that are trying to get this positive change. Do you think the inflow into passive will change it a bit? Uh, it's a very good question. In the past, it were primarily active managers who were just promoting this because for them it was a clear decision. If they like something, they buy it. And if they don't like it, they don't buy it. So obviously the pressure on a company is pretty high to listen to them because then the asset manager is not going to buy it. Yeah. And in the past, then what the passive asset managers were saying, well, but as long as it's part of the index, we buy it. Yeah. So we cannot do anything, which is not totally true. They, they have been talking to, to the management boards or something like that. But gun manufacturer is a very good example where they just offer products to clients which are excluding gun manufacturers or they in, invest into indices which don't have certain vices in them, no mm -hmm. tobacco or no, no something like that. And that is, for example, true in Belgium. You're not allowed to invest in cluster bomb manufacturers. So therefore, just all have to take cluster bombs manufacturers are out, out of the index. So I think the good thing is also many of the, well, I, I would say most of the uh, passive managers are now also 
acting or reacting to to these kind of changes of consumer behavior as well mm -hmm. or an end investor behavior do you think additionally that also active managers want ESG so they have a reason to be still in the game because now they are the ones taking care of ESG and uh, social responsibility? Most of the asset managers cannot afford anymore to say we don't look at ESG. Mm -hmm. If you look at some ads of asset managers who like five years ago or even three years ago never were thinking about ESG, now they say well we are ESG is in the shop window and we we uh, adhere to these principles and UNPRI would just have been around for such a long time. I think th actually the asset managers cannot afford cannot afford to ignore it. Okay. Do you feel that the trend towards passive investing is actually affecting active investing in a way that now the market is basically less crowded, there's like less eyes on it. Do you think there are now coming back more chances in active investment? Uh, this would be very logical. I think just if more and more is just going to kind of passive, there's a company which is not doing so, so well, there should be a difference over time between company A, which is doing very poorly and company B, B which which is doing very well. But I think the proof is in the pudding, like what the Brits would say, it just, it hasn't materialized yet. But over time, this should definitely just provide more positive alpha generation for active managers, in particular those who have more concentrated uh, portfolios. Would you see that in the future this trend is going to continue more towards passive, more towards algorithmic investing? And then, I mean, margins are already decreasing by a very rapid pace in asset management. Do you see there are big challenges and troubles ahead for asset managers? Asset management, just like banks, just become a lot more of a normal industry where just you just have some scale producers and some niche producers and some very large producers and there will be opportunities for all of these classes. It's just like in real life, it's, it's a problem for those as a managers which are somewhere in the middle, kind of who don't have mm -hmm. a USP, who don't, are uh, not particularly cheap, those who are particularly uh, poor in their cost structure, who don't have a good distribution force, who don't have, who maybe you have too many product, products or too few products or something like that. I find this quite normal for this industry. And you cannot generalize. There will be some big winners mm -hmm. and there will also be some, some, some losers. And it's just about direction. It's about focus, it's about the right products, it's about also like to use uh, kind of digital as an opportunity and just take whatever the, the blockchain technology in order to reduce costs and to make it more efficient. I think asset management will continue to be a very exciting industry. You just, I think you just need to pick the company a lot more Uh, in terms of kind of who is going to be the winner and who is maybe not going to be the winner. Yeah. Please. So I could say to your question is, is it going to be tough? I could say yes and no. It depends on wh where, where you are. Mm -hmm. But probably that the times where you could just set up an asset management shop and you would be successful without really putting a lot of work in it. I think um, that never existed. Okay. That, I, think, <laughs> I think that never existed. But it's just the cost of regulation, which mm -hmm. is a big barrier to entry for smaller asset managers, it's, which is a lot more than what what you had before. It's not so much like active or passive, algorithmic or something like that, but just the number of people and control people and and everything else you need in order to set up an asset manager is is very difficult 
for any asset manager to start with, mm-hmm. which doesn't have a track record, which doesn't have money to to have a Geldwäsche beauftragte or what, <laughs> yeah. whatever, a risk manager, an auditor, and controller, and this and this and this and this. So this, these are the the uh, barriers to entry. So it was supposed to increase competition or to get more transparent. Actually, might have made it more difficult to compete with each other, right? Or at least for smaller managers to to like say to rock up the market from below. Yes, there will be new asset managers. Mm. It it is just a lot more difficult, and yeah. you just need good sponsors who just give you the seed money to start investing. But just those who just do a little bit of family and friends money, it will be very difficult for them. Okay. Thank you for those insights. We have a lot of young listeners on the show. Mm -hmm. So it's always very helpful for somebody as senior and as seasoned as you to give some advice. You said yourself, like you, you started in auditing, then you went to trading. What tips do you have for somebody that wants to start in the industry nowadays to get into the industry? Are like prestigious master's programs a good thing? The CFA, Kaya, extracurricular activities. What would you recommend to somebody starting out? The first job is actually quite important, and the first job is kind of here we go into what what the right university, what kind of grades do you need, and what kind of internships you need. But I think first of all, your CV look, has to look good so that it attracts attention mm-hmm. uh, to the people who are then going to interview you. Then many of the things which are on the paper don't count anymore. Because that means if you just only lived and worked in the same place these days, went to the same university, uh, like wait in your hometown or something like that, never went abroad, never did an internship except for a parent's company or something like <laughs> that, it, it's, it's pretty difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, so therefore, if you just turn around, you just need to show that you're flexible, that you've been around in, in, in the world, and that you just don't... It's not like that you know how to travel, but it's just you know how to uh, communicate with people in other areas, other countries, mm-hmm. who maybe just have very d- different manners or different views about the world or something like that you, that you can communicate. I think that's that's quite important. Whether you really just have to have only internships in asset management, if you want to work in asset management, I don't think it's actually, for me, it was always good to just have a very broad view of the world and if somebody has been working as a chef in a restaurant is maybe as interesting as somebody who has been doing five asset management jobs before <laughs> um, but once once you're in I think it's very important that you just try to go the extra mile quite mm-hmm. often also show tenacity be prudent try to do the right thing try to do something extra all the time. But quite often, that is not enough. I think it's very important for young people, but also in, in the mid, midterm career, that you have a mentor, mm-hmm. that you just have somebody to, you can ask, well, I don't understand this. Why, does, why is the organization happening this way? Or why, why do I have a problem with my co-colleague Oh, why do I have a problem with my boss or something like mm. that? So it's it's very important that to have a more senior person who is just occasionally mentoring you, not on a day to day basis or week to week basis, but once in a while you just have to say, I don't understand it. Kind of, am I too blunt? Am I too direct? Or am, mm. am I too friendly? Why is it that other people just progress a lot more than me? And that's, that has to do with your organizational culture and it has to do with kind of with the company itself that you just find your ways through, through the organization. The, another thing is kind of don't give up easily. Lots of people do that. Kind of if something doesn't work or if they just 
are not being promoted on time, that they just um, stick to it. If it's the right company, then then just stay on. Yeah, and just maybe head, uh, leave your head down for a while and, and then just do a good job. And I'm sure that other people will just see that you're doing a good job. And in the next, next round of promotions, you would be considered. Now, lots of people actually give up the first time and say, well, how is it possible that they, they get promoted and I didn't? And so therefore they just give up and go someplace else. And I think it's coming back to your initial question. You need to work at good firms. Mm -hmm. It's always easy to move down to a second tier or third tier or something like that, but it's very, very difficult to move from a third tier company to a first tier company. So start with best. There's never just the one. But there are always like five or ten companies which mm -hmm. are just like in the first tier or something like that. We really try very hard to be, be there and then whatever, if, if you have been work, working for five or ten or fifteen or twenty years in the industry, then there's always kind of, if you want to progress in your career, then you can consider just moving maybe down a notch or something like that. But many people actually then only want to be the top at the top firm. Mm -hmm. Don't start low. Okay, that's some very great advice right there. I want to jump in on the part with the mentor. How do I approach a mentor? How do I ask people to be my mentor? And how do I choose the right people? In many larger companies, you, there's actually a ment mentoring program. Okay. Ask whether it exists. But otherwise, if there's no official mentoring program, then just ask somebody who's obviously shouldn't be your boss uh, because mm -hmm. that it, it cannot be your boss. But if you see somebody who is just can deal with you properly and who has, I think, the values you would like to, to see it in the company and who is successful, just ask. Most people are not going to say no unless they overly busy or they have 20 mentees already mm -hmm. but just ask them and don't give up if if the first person says no then just pick pick another person this is kind of we i spoke about tenacity yeah. before that's that's something you just also need to need to learn if a says no then go to b or c to a d yeah mm -hmm. you know it's it's a little bit more difficult in smaller companies but Even there, there would be some people you, you could just ask. And it doesn't have to be except in your department. It can be like in an adjacent department, which has a different view about the organization or something like that. It's not about kind of a specific topic in the organization where they can help you, but rather how to move, move around or just how to move around With with maybe a difficult boss mm -hmm. uh, or with, with a difficult coworker, or something like that. I mean, most of, most of the topics that should be come up in a mentoring is not the the really daily doing, right? The knowledge you have to do for your job because that yeah. you can get from your coworkers. But what is interesting, what mentor is like the personality, how to grow personally, how to advance yeah. in those difficult topics. So. Yeah. I don't think it's a big difference whether where this person is coming from or which department. Yeah, yeah. It just it just has to be the person has to be in the company for several years. And that's one, and just also kind of maybe a little bit of a role model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In every company, there are these kind of people you would like to talk to. Just don't get on their their nerves. So don't <laughs> ask every week or something like that. Just ask quarterly lunches or coffees or something mm -hmm. like that. Is there any last thing you would like to leave our audience with before we round up the interview? I think the finance industry, which has been, has been battered quite a bit since the financial crisis as a mm -hmm. whole, but also as a management, I still think it's, it's very exciting. You know, just being in the world of markets, and after all, that's that's what you do. It's like you see equities or currencies or fixed income securities. You have to think about what's happen happening in the world with 
there's something in China going on or something in Latin America going on. So you just, if, if you on a day-to-day -day basis are thinking about global interaction or crisis here or economic growth there or inflation there, I think it just makes you a lot more of a world citizen than many of the other jobs. And that always did excite me and, and that hasn't changed. Maybe some of the things are a lot tougher now than they were when I started. Mm -hmm. I don't know too many jobs which are better than jobs in the finance industry. Very good. Thank you so much, Peter, for coming here today. It was a great pleasure to have you here. I personally learned a lot and I hope we can keep in touch. It was good being here. Thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast. For the show notes and much more, visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com. To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not be treated as investment, tax, financial or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and it does not contain an offer to sell or buy any sort of financial products and should not be treated as advertisement for such. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the prior permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.